Hey folks, today we have a video on yet another computer I bought from the Nostalgia Mall, uh, I want to say a couple years ago, like two years ago maybe. Uh, this is a Dell Optiplex GX110, the famous Pentium 3 desktop that I think everybody saw in the late 90s, early 2000s, maybe even up to the mid 2000s. In fact, in my high school, we had a couple of these in the writing center in the back that were just kind of forgotten computers and I used a, I used them a couple times to get a few assignments done and uh, they ran Windows 98 and they were full of viruses and uh, the teachers would say don't email stuff to yourself on there you're just gonna give yourself a bunch of viruses and they were Windows 98 viruses the rest of the computer lab had a mix of late 90s IMAX and Dell Optiplexes and things like that uh, black Dell Optiplexes, not these older ones, but this is a computer that's significant to my upbringing just because of that, uh, that I used a couple of these in high school. And they're pretty solid Pentium 3 machines. That's the one thing I'll give these. If you've ever used something like a, a Compact Desk Pro EN, or just a Compact Desk Pro in general, it's definitely this, these are definitely in the same league as that, I would say. They're, they're quite good machines. Now this one, unfortunately, got a bit damaged in shipping, because uh, 90s pl is this 90s? Yeah, again, 90s, early 2000s, whatever. Old computer plastic was made of ABS plastic, and th this particular plastic they had back in the day used to used to dry out, or it's, I guess not used to. It does dry out, and uh, as a result, if you ship one of these computers, even if it's packed well, and it's like February outside, and it's cold. Um, this sort of thing can happen. I thought I still had the plastic pieces somewhere, but I don't. It's not damaged in a way that affects it latching to the front. There's still a little bit of a clip under there's still a clip under there that holds the uh, front bezel in, so it's not the end of the world. It just looks kind of ugly. But yet, despite that little uh, putina there, that little blemish, it uh, it works fine. The I.O. on the back is pretty good. We'll start over here with the power supply. You have a parallel port, a serial port, PS2 mouse and keyboard ports, USB 1.1. All this I.O. is starting to look kind of similar to the Pentium 2, isn't it? Just maybe a little bit less of it. Uh, another serial port here. And uh, here you have your PCI slots. And you have onboard VGA for video. Eth built-in Ethernet, so this could technically be part of the NetPC standard, I guess, even though I think it was a bit late for that. And onboard sound, so it has just about everything you need to have a fully functional PC, and it's all onboard stuff. So Pentium 2, Pentium 3 is around that era where everything reached that point. Pentium 3 especially with the onboard video, because you remember with the gateway, it actually needed a video card, and they gave you a voodoo, of all things. This just has all Intel onboard video. Uh, a few of the compacts I've seen, do some of them come with onboard, I think, NVIDIA graphics. I don't know if the Optiplex did. I would assume so, just because it's of that era where they used to put things like that on motherboards. Uh, not that you couldn't add your own card, but it would have been nice if they included that. My Compact Desk Pro EN is the same way. It also has built-in Intel video. But as you'll see, the Intel video in this isn't that bad. It actually performs okay. One of my favorite things about these Dells is maintenance. The case design is really easy. There are two buttons on the side here, and you push those in together, and the case opens up, almost like the uh, almost like the those cars where you can open the hood frontways, and you have access to everything, which we're, we'll take a look at. Now, thankfully, in this machine, there's a little more to say than there was about the Pentium 2. The Pentium 2 is a pretty typical design, where. Uh, it basically used the power supply to cool everything. This is the same way. It uses the power supply to basically cool everything except for the CPU here. Uh, com that's one thing of note. Computers of this era are not like the computers of today where you need really good airflow to cool everything off because stuff gets hot now. Back in this, back in this day, Stuff really didn't get that hot. You know, it was basically the power supply and the CPU that got hot. If you had a GPU in there, maybe it needed a fan, maybe if it was super high end. But that things just were easily passively cooled back in the day. They didn't let off as much heat dissipation. Or just they just didn't give off as much heat in general, I should say. And uh, yeah, this computer is the same way. 
It's got a nice fat heatsink on the Pentium 3. This is a 733 megahertz Pentium 3 copper mine. And on the board, you can see all the stuff here is integrated. There's BGA chips all over the place, various chipsets and things. 3COM and Broadcom on the chip right there. This has... I can't remember the amount of RAM. We'll look in the BIOS when we boot it up. I want to say it's 128 or something like that. Here's your VRMs and stuff here. Those capacitors all look pretty good. It's a little dusty in here. It could do with a cleaning. Now, as far as I.O. goes, it started to get limited by this time. And the old Sound Blaster compatibility standards and stuff were starting to go away. Uh, at least in office machines, because it just didn't matter by this point, especially in the office, when all you need to do is hear your email beep at you. So you just have your typical three PCI slots. And PCI was good at the time. You could expand that with uh, Ethernet cards, graphics cards, modems, things like that, and just not have a problem. However, if you're into DOS gaming, uh, getting a card that's Sound Blaster compatible uh, was, pro was a little more of a challenge. Uh, you could get cards that were. The original Sound Blaster Audigy, I, I believe, has pretty decent uh, Sound Blaster emulation. So you could you could have gotten one of those, but it was very hit or miss. Uh, Sound Blaster 128 could have put, been put in here. MIDI would work, but it wouldn't be great, as you saw from the previous gateway. So, plenty of I.O. expansion. I chose to use no expansion in this machine. Uh, because everything on here works. It's an office machine. I don't really want to expand it. It's fine as is just to use it and experience it for fun. It's not like a dream DOS gaming machine. Uh, in fact, it's not really a DOS gaming machine at all. It's a workhorse. One thing I did is I did replace this battery. It was dead uh, when I got it, so now it actually remembers my settings, which is good. I do need to clean it. As you can see, that fan's a little dirty and the board's a little dirty. I'll, I'll get to that when I have a nice cleaning session with these computers. As you can see here, it has an IDE channel there. Another IDE channel right here for the CD-ROM drive and an, a floppy channel for right here, August 2000. So this computer probably was made in the year 2000 and sent out to be used for a business. So. Yeah, there you have it. That's the inside of the machine. Now, the one thing this machine is missing is the hard drive uh, cage. I don't know what this is for. This might be might have something to do with it. I'm not sure, but uh, down here is where a hard drive bracket would mount, and that doesn't appear to be here. So this piece of plastic just happened to be in here too, so what I did is I just laid this... SD card adapter on top of the piece of plastic and that's been acting as the uh, the hard drive and it's been doing a good job these SD card adapters do a great job in old machines like this so if you ever thought about getting an SD card adapter when provisioning a hard drive just isn't convenient or possible like with this machine or if you want to convert to solid state and be able to switch installs and things very easily uh, the SD card adapters I think are the way to go I have a few CF card adapters, but finding CF cards that are compatible is a little bit more wonky than just using an SD card adapter. So that's what I've settled on with this machine. And it works very well. There's a 32 gig SD card in there, so it's about the size of some of the other drives in my Windows 98, ME, 2000 era sort of machines. So fits in very well with all of those. Of course, the one thing I would do is I want to mount this eventually if I were to if I were to make this permanent. But this is just what I could find in my stash of stuff to make this computer work. So, you know, it's it's good enough for now. It makes everything do its job the way it's supposed to. So, I'm just not really going to mess with it just yet. And this cable is just making a mess of everything. So nothing shorts out seems to be fine so there you have it that's the hardware of the machine why don't we boot it up and take a look at it alright here we are with the setup got the computer here I have a controller plugged in for some of the 3D games the gateway's still back there but it's not being used and I decided to drag out this Dell monitor which is a little bit bigger has a built-in uh, uh, sound bar on the bottom so it'll be a lot better for filming I think uh, the other Dell monitor I have, I think, looks a little better at lower resolutions, but 
this monitor is super convenient, so we'll be using that today. One thing I have to do now, thanks to the uh, awfully high voltage that I get in my areas, I have to run these old computers and things. I run them on a Variac like this, uh, just because my voltage is too high. So that's a tip. If you have unusually high voltage in your area, just because the infrastructure isn't sound or whatever, uh, get yourself a Variac, even one of these cheap ones that's not very high rated. You can see this one's only about 500 VA. Uh, that's enough to run an old computer like this and, you know, treat the power supply nicely. The other, the other alternative is to use a UPS, but they, I already ha happen to have this for old equipment, so that's my solution to this problem. And without further ado, let's turn on the computer and get into the BIOS here and show you a few things in there. There we go. Alert, cover was previously removed. So there's a there's a chassis intrusion switch that I need to figure out in there. I don't know if it's been removed or I need to put a jumper somewhere or what, but uh, yeah, that's kind of an issue. Do you see those humbars going up and down on the screen there? That's not viewable in person. That's only on camera. Huh. I guess that's the, uh, I guess that's the frequency of the, uh, the fluorescent backlighting interfering with the camera's frame rate. That's a bit interesting. Okay, so got to auto adjust this. That's better. So here we are. Here we are at the Dell BIOS. And as you can see, it's a Pentium 3 733, uh, 256K of level 2 cache. And uh, it's keeping the time and date now. It sees the CF card as a hard drive, and it sees the CD ROM reader. So this is not a burner or a DVD drive, it's your plain Jane CD ROM. And I was right. We have 128 megs of RAM, so that's two 64 meg sticks. Has AC power recovery and everything like that. It's a pretty decent BIOS on this machine, actually. So there's nothing to change in here, so let's boot this thing up. Windows Millennium Edition is what I put on here. Because the newer driver stack in Windows Millennium Edition... May, it just worked out of the box. I didn't have to do anything. It just worked. And it makes a pretty competent Windows ME machine. It's pretty stable. Windows ME, historically, is very picky about what computer you run it on. Some of them run it great. Some of them don't run it so well. Uh, Vista was the same way. Uh, Vista was very picky as well. But ME runs great on this computer because these Pentium 3 machines are usually pretty rock solid. And there you have it. There is my Windows ME desktop. There you go, it's running Windows ME 4.90.3000. I didn't add any patches or anything to this, so it's just the original uh, version. I should probably update it. I don't know. It, I, I, don't, I don't know if I care enough. Alright, so here we have display adapters. It's the Intel 82881... Intel 82810 graphic controller. So this is the Intel 810 chipset. I don't remember if that's the infamous one. Maybe the 815 is the infamous one. The 810 I think is, I think is okay. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, what else we got in here? There's your 3Com fast Ethernet controller. So this has 10100 Ethernet built in. This is just your Intel AC97 audio. So it is nothing special. It's very limited and it's uh, uh, ability. It just basically it's made for PCM audio, you know, digital audio, not really MIDI or anything like that. It can do it, but it uses the Microsoft uh, built in MIDI, as far as my understanding goes. We'll find out in a second here. All right, so in devices, uh, in MIDI, we just have MIDI for AC97. So <laughs> fairly limited, I would say. Yeah, a very generic driver. So, Microsoft GS Wavetable Synth. That's what we get for MIDI. So, of course, we'll demonstrate that just so you have a reminder of what it sounds like. We'll demonstrate that with the MIDI that came with Windows ME, which is Flourish.
you have it. That is Flourish. So, you know, the MIDI's competent. It works. But the GW uh, MIDI is not as good as something like a Sound Blaster or Gus or an MT32, obviously. Uh, it's, it's there just for, pretty much just for compatibility, I would say. So, let's see if I can squeeze in here without getting in the way of the camera. Hey! All right, the other thing we can do is we can look at Everest Home. I've been using this, of course, in all my vintage computer uh, videos just because it shows what's on the board pretty darn well. It is a Compromine Pentium 3, Pentium 3E. I wonder what the E stands for. The instruction sets, of course, it has MM, MMX and SSE. So, you know, fairly modern chip for the time. Motherboard... Oh, Dial Optiplex GX110, there you go. Uh, memory. It has the Intel Whitney i810E chipset. Phoenix BIOS from the year 2000, from September 18, 2000. How about that? The video BIOS dates from 2019, really? Wow. Or maybe it's from 1919, hey! Here's your Intel graphics controller. Intel i752. That's what it says that is. It supports up to DirectX 6.0. That's what it, that seems to be what this uh, program always says. It does support OpenGL though, as you'll see. Yeah, I don't know. It doesn't show anything there. A lot of Intel in this computer, as you can see. So there you have it. That is a look at the computer. Now, one thing I've done is I've hooked this computer up to the internet so we can actually go to certain web pages and they will render just fine. This Retrozilla browser runs really well on uh, Windows ME, actually. Uh, someone on Mastodon uh, asked if this ran on another computer I'm working on and I tried it on that one that you'll see in a future video and this one and it works great on this one so you know we go to Google for example renders Google pretty well even in the old format but we can also go to some of the sites that Action Retro runs such as 68k.news Europe markets close 2.3% lower. Bank stocks slide the most in a year after HSBC rescues Silicon Valley Bank UK. Oh man, what a what a crazy time it is to be alive, right? Crazy stuff going on. Looks like New Hampshire's getting snow. California is having crazy weather right now. And uh, Dallas is having some bullets fly. So there you go. This is kind of how the internet used to be. You know, you you go to a web page like this that's pretty simple, and then you just, you know, read what you want to read. Very text and animated GIF and um, maybe a few low-resolution pictures, things like that. Yeah, there you go. Shout out to Action Retro for running these websites. Uh, the other one I can think of is Frog Find. I think it's .com? Yeah, here it is. So let's say we want to search for... Uh, Dell Optiplex, Optiplex GX110 drivers, Windows ME. Hey, there you go. There you have it. Old internet at its finest. Now, this isn't hooked up through um, the Wayback Machines DNS or whatever that is at all, so it's just the, the raw internet, but it can do it. I also have WinSCP on here, and it can connect to SFTP servers. So if you run your own server and you want to bring software on and off old machines, uh, like I run a Linux server to do that, and Linux has SFTP built in. So you can use an old version of WinSCP to do that. Although I would, you know, I would be very cautious about that because this is old. These are old pieces of software with probably very old versions of SSL. So. You know, make sure your network is secure. Maybe even put it on another VLAN if you're worried about it. But it works. And, of course, computers like this were used for office work. So why wouldn't we do some office work, right? 
Word 97. There you go. I'm a real business man. <laughs> well, there you go. Office 97. I think on a machine like this, Office 2000 would be a better fit, but 97 was just convenient, so that's what I put on there. Lots of stuff on here. Lots of stuff. Uh, it'll, of course, run CD-ROM edutainment games for your kids. It will run games like Half-Life for the adults and, you know, Need for Speed, Porsche Unleashed, Age of Empires 2... Posing force, you know. But first, let's demonstrate kit picks, because why not? Kitpix, even in the year 2000, had style. It really did. Now, last time I tried this on the Gateway, I didn't think it had uh, the bomb erase, but I'm an idiot. Look at that right there. It's right there in front of my face, so... Oh, let's put some trees all over the place. Then use the bomb. The bomb never left us. I led y'all astray. I'm so sorry. It's still there. So it's a real version of Kid Picks. <laughs> We're not going to be as thorough this time because you've seen enough of that. As far as the games I've tried, most of them have been completely fine, honestly. Uh, like, let's try Opposing Force, for example. The Half-Life add-on where you play as the military part. I love that old Sierra logo so much. Gearbox made this uh, particular expansion, and they're very loud. So what are our graphics settings here, if I can find them? 800 by 600? Let's see what that does. We'll do boot camp. about that. The video mode it was in before that was pure software seemed to work better. So let's do that. Let's try that again. There we go. Pixelated with the software rendering, but it runs smoothly this way. What's your name, dirtbag? Sound off like you got a pair. Corporal Shepherd, huh? Looks more like Corporal Dog Meat to me. Seems your name was mysteriously bumped to the top of the advanced training list. My suggestion to you is to get your ass down to the training center and report to Drill Instructor Sharp ASAP. Now move it, Corporal. 
are you from, soldier? Texas? Holy cow! You know what comes from Texas, don't you? <laughs> I love how they made fun of Full Metal Jacket. It's just beautiful. You are balling me, boy! You are balling me, boy! You better square yourself away, maggot! I smell smoke, and where there's smoke, there's fire! You better move it, soldier! I'm having a little trouble with the mouse here. Yeah, runs great with software rendering at 400 by 300. Probably doesn't look that great on this monitor. It'd look better on the CRT, but uh, it works. But there you go. Those are the sacrifices you make. Just run it in software rendering and it doesn't stutter. Making fun of Full Metal Jacket again. But yeah, you can play games like Half Life and its various um, expansions, no problem on a machine like this. I think you could use a graphics card personally for things like this, but you can get those. Get, just get yourself an ATI or an NVIDIA card or something. Alright, Maggot, listen up! I don't care what your previous outfit was like, but around here we do things my way! Follow my instructions carefully, and by the end of the day, I'll have you eating danger and crapping victory! Yeah, America! Now move your butt, soldier! I will meet you on the other side, in the armory! Well, there you go. Bada bing. Let's try a new game and see how it is actually shooting. Nope, keep going. They start out in a helicopter as usual. So it's a little bit more of a graphically intensive situation. And you can see how smooth it is out that window there. Full Metal Jacket. Ow. This is another search and rescue operation. I'm gonna be pissed. Yeah, I'm gonna be pissed. All right, I don't feel like waiting that long. So, well, there you go. That training part was enough to show that it can run games like that. And of course, you can run other real-time strategy games like Age of Empires 2. And it's Expansion of the Conquerors, Need for Speed, Porsche Unleashed. It actually runs Need for Speed pretty well. I think uh, that one's probably worth demonstrating, to be honest. Uh, the other thing that I was surprised this could run quite well was uh, those Disney games that we took a look at in the last one. It has a little trouble running Toy Story 2, so that's probably the one we should look at. It runs A Bug's Life pretty much just fine. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at Toy Story 2. And we'll do it in hardware at 640 by 400. What the hell? There we go. 640 by 480. How about a real resolution? So this is running with the Intel onboard graphics using its probably Direct3D or DirectX or OpenGL to run it. 
Here it is doing 3D rendering. Seems to work pretty well, honestly, considering what it is. It's doing 3D just fine. I can't seem to get that damn coin. Yeah, it, it, it's running quite well. I want to see what it what it is like up up top here. We'll go up the uh, into the attic here. Look how wonky that camera is. These are early 3D games, man. The frame rate does stutter down a little bit. See, it kind of when you look over here, it slows down, but when you look at the wall here where there's less stuff, it gets nice and smooth. You look back here, chops up a little bit, but not so much that it's unplayable. So that, to me, that's pretty impressive for Intel graphics. Ow! Wow! Tire, tire the robot out. Oh, there you have it. That's Toy Story for you. It works great, honestly. A Bug's Life runs even better than that, so... The onboard graphics of this really aren't that bad. Like, to be totally honest with you, they seem to work just fine. Phantom program with a name this time. That's interesting. Where I'll end things with this demonstration is Need for Speed Porsche Unleashed, which is a game I grew up with. Had quite a bit of fun playing on Windows 98, our Windows 98 machine, which was a Dell Dimension at the time, which had a Pentium 2 in it, and it still ran this game pretty well. So I imagine with this Pentium 3, even with all its onboard stuff, it'll run just fine. Now, since I'm running Windows ME, there's really no DOS plans for this machine at all. You know, why would there be? I have other machines that can run DOS great. So this one's strictly just Windows stuff. Which is why I have Windows ME instead of 98 on it. Because it's really not worth the trouble of getting 98 to work when ME works perfectly fine on here. And plays all these old CD-ROM games, no problem. Alright, let's do a quick race. We're going to use a 911 S2.4 coupe. This has a loud CD-ROM drive, as you can hear. Alright, let's see if the controller works with it. Hopefully I can use the controller. If not, I will use the keyboard. This has a very loud CD-ROM drive. Hey, Three, controller's working. Two, one, go! Shit. Doesn't work. I gotta use the keyboard. I'm already behind. This isn't good. Oh no! Oh boy, here we go. So, as you can see, the, the performance is pretty darn good. Oh god. I'm driving like crap, but that's okay. The only thing I think that really suffers with the onboard Intel graphics is the lighting and the color a little bit. It uses a lot more dithering, I would say, than um, other graphical solutions at the time might use. Like, if you had an NVIDIA card, it would definitely look a little better than this. But, as you can see, I'm holding my own pretty well. And key rollover not good, not working. Yeah, there you go. That's a good example of 3D games that work well on the onboard Intel graphics. I don't know if you can see that there. There's a little bit of like lines that are just kind of coming in and out there. So there's graphical artifacting and things like that. But it all works. You know, not a thing is really broken. So. I can't complain, personally. So that is a demonstration of what this little baby can do. I think, in terms of vintage computing, these newer Pentium 3 machines, when they don't have ISIS slots 
and you can't really you don't really have access to decent MIDI sound. It really limits their ability to do much. I mean, you could stick DOSBox on here and solve that problem if you wanted to, like especially if you couldn't find yourself a decent vintage machine. You could put DOSBox on an old computer like this and use that for all your DOS stuff. But you might as well just put that on your main computer, you know? <laughs> It, at that po at that point, it's not really worth it, in my opinion. You might as well just... For CD-ROM games, yes. Definitely an old computer is merited, but... It, DOS, on on a machine like this, when it's not really that compatible with it, I, I wouldn't bother, to be honest. Like, sound-wise is what I'm saying. I don't know graphics-wise if it is or not. Because remember those problems we had with blood, with that voodoo. Now, I do have DOS games on here we can try, so I could, of course, try Duke Nukem 3D, but, you know, you have to use General MIDI to make all this stuff work, so. We're not going to have sound effects or anything like that. I mean, yeah, I do have DOS games on here. They technically do work, but uh, just not really well with the sound, I would say. And there are other applications you can use. There's things like Audacity that work just fine. So, you know, it can be useful as a utility machine to a certain extent, I would say. Uh, the one thing that did run better on this machine are my old, compu are my old games that I made in 3D Game Maker. So... Why don't we start up Terra Fortress here and show you just how fast it works. Windows ME seems to run these games extremely well, and that's partly because they were developed on 3D Game Maker on Windows ME machines 20 years ago. So as you can see, it, it loads a hell of a lot faster and works a lot faster than it did on the Pentium 2 400. The music will come up, it'll actually load at a decent speed. Uh, so if you want to mess around with something like 3D Game Maker or FPS Maker, a uh, Penny and 3 machine might just be your ticket in, because I'm pretty sure that's what I developed uh, all these games on, were Penny and 3 machines, just like this. Um, I don't think they were Dell Octoplexes, I think they were either Compaq or HP at the time, but they were a similar class of machine. And this is not loading as quickly as I thought, but we're not seeing, I don't see error messages when I run it, and it doesn't, um, it doesn't annoy Windows ME enough to make it run ScanDisk every time like it did on Windows 98 on the, uh, the gateway. So, so we'll have this thing load. Quite a bit faster loading than on the uh, the other one, and as you'll see, the uh, the frame rate is a lot better too. Yeah, see how smooth this is on here. There's a bit of a stutter there, but it worked. The sound is crackling though, as you can hear. So the sound drivers aren't particularly good. They're the built-in Windows ME ones, so I guess what do you expect? But. The games are running and working pretty well, apart from the sound. So that's just a little interesting last tidbit about Windows ME. It seems to run my games the best, which is very odd. I've had them run on XP before too, but it throws up errors on XP quite often as well when I've tried them on there. Windows ME is what they're developed on, so naturally that's the best fit for them. I swear, I wrote the easiest game in the world. But yeah, they, they run pretty smoothly on here. They run a lot more smoothly than they do on the Pentium 2. And the Pentium 2 had a gra pretty good graphics card to help it out. So, CPU is clearly the bottleneck of that machine. And there you go. Once again, if you want to play uh, all these games here, I, I did put them on archive.org, so I'll put a link in the description if you really want to. Genjox works just fine on here as well. I demonstrated that in the last video. Uh, so, 
Yeah, there you have it. That's uh, the Dell Optiplex GX110. All in all, a pretty good machine for its time. A uh, pretty classic Pentium 3 office machine. Uh, it's not as spectacular or special as some other vintage computers, but I still like it. It's a pretty solid machine. And let's say that you're into, into Windows 2000 or something like that. A, a machine like this would be perfect to run that. But it also runs a variety of operating systems. It even says so on the sticker on the front. It'll run 98, ME, 2000, it'll run XP, uh, I'd say pre-service pack 2 pretty well, and it'll run Windows NT4 just fine too. So these Penny and 3 machines are a good class of computer to run a variety of operating systems on. For me, Windows ME seems to fit this one pretty well, so that's what I chose. And as you can see, it works great for my needs. Anyhow, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you'd like to reach me on social media, my links are down below, and our Discord chat is down below as well, as well as the link to uh, my games if you want to play those. So, Have a good one, everybody. Ciao.